Hi everyone, we're here. We figured out our technical issues. I don't know what they were. <laughs> Do you know what they were, Bridget? <laughs> Nothing was working. I had to download a whole new browser. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what took so long. I was like, oh shoot. I think I need a whole new browser. And then I tried it, the link in another one and it was like, it doesn't support this. And I don't have an old computer. I just, I don't know what was going on. So I apologize um, for my tardiness. Oh, that's okay. I can't. Um, well, for, first of all, I'm really late for everything. And like anyone who knows me in real life and probably anybody who has ever watched me try to live stream here knows that I'm late for everything. <laughs> so hopefully everyone has grown to accept it and learn that it's totally worth it. That's why you're in Mexico, way. though. I feel like you can. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm here, so that I can be more comfortable with my lateness. <laughs> like, I just want to be with my people. <laughs> Vancouver, people actually get mad when you're 40 minutes late for every single exactly. thing. Yeah, time. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, first of all, everyone, I already told you this, but I have a cold, so I'm sorry that I sound congested, and I really am hoping that I don't start. I was just in San Francisco and like, I think every single time I get on a plane, I get a cold. So apparently the masks aren't working. Nope. <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully I don't start coughing midstream, but I'll try to mute myself if I do. Um, do you have COVID? <clears throat> I don't think I have COVID. I don't actually, I think I've never, I don't think I've ever had COVID before. I mean, I don't really know, maybe I have. Have you had COVID, do you know? I thought I had it really early in the pan in the pandemic. I, yeah. I had all the symptoms of it, but I didn't have any antibodies. But they tested me in May, and I'm not sure how great those tests were in May of 2020. And then okay. by the time I got tested again, I don't know that they would have still been there. So I, but I had like shortness of breath and was sick for a month and exhausted and um. So yeah, I had a lot of the symptoms of it, but. Yeah, I've had, there's been a couple times when I thought that I had it, but then I also got the antibody test. <sighs> Can you hear somebody sawing upstairs? <laughs> I can. <laughs> it's 8 p.m. It's 8 p.m. here, and apparently they've just started to start sawing. Like, literally, there's like... What are they doing? Is it like bodies? What are you there's sawing like... <laughs> at 8 p.m.? I want there... that. They're, well, they're 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 renovating or they're like well they're building an apartment on top of me. Oh. Um. I I live in like a favela in Mexico, uh -huh. <laughs> so it's like a million different like janky apartments all on like a giant concrete hill covered in ants. Okay. Um, but I guess but they just built mine and they're building one on top of me. But one would think that the <laughs> building would stop. <laughs> They don't have those laws down there, I don't think. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> anyway, I yeah, I don't. I, and then I got I got the antibody test when I did Rogan. Actually, they the the woman who was doing the COVID test there was like, "Do you want an antibody test?" And they said I didn't have any. And I was like pretty surprised because I was like, "How could? How is it possible that I haven't had COVID?" Like again, I'd had a couple of illnesses where I thought I'd had like most of the symptoms. And then also, like, I haven't been careful at all ever, like, and I've been around, like, a million people, so I'm, like, I don't know how it would be possible that I haven't had it yet. And when was that, that you were on Rogan and tested? I think in August. Okay. So pretty recently. Yeah, so I don't know. But anyway, I think this is just a cold. But, they still exist too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can get other kinds of illnesses. Anyway, okay, so enough about me. Everyone, thanks for uh, coming. This is Bridget, and we're very excited to have her here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming, even though you're pregnant. <laughs> so you continue to live. <laughs> I'm still here. It's funny, though, how early I get tired. I feel like a grandma. But I've also been getting up earlier just in general, but I feel like at six o'clock will hit now and I'm like, God, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I don't I don't know why. And people have to keep reminding me like you're building a human. <laughs> um, I'm still not quite. I still haven't got my mind around it. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, 
So this was like a surprise to you, right? Yeah, it was a sh not just a surprise, a shock and a, a joke from God or, <laughs> or whatever. Um, a mirror. Some might say a miracle. I might say um, it just it is like man plans and God laughs. You know, we just we we were told we're but my husband and I are both quite late bloomers. We met in recovery in in our forties. Um, and we went back east to visit my family and then really saw all my siblings. I've, I'm the oldest of five. So we saw all my siblings out. They all have kids and we, and all my cousins have kids and we were like, we're good. You know, <laughs> we sat on the beach and we're like, we're okay. We'll travel. We just got back from South Africa, like a, a year in that February or March. And we were totally like, we'll save money. We'll travel. And we're cool with that. We don't need to, because we were talking, you know, in June, I had seen my OB and she was like, if you're going to have kids, you have to do it now. You need to go talk to like a fertility specialist. And I'm like, do we want to like go through all this? And I had a conversation with a, a guy who is a fertility doctor and he was like, you need to get all these prenatals and then we'll have you come in and they measure your uterus when you're like on day two of your period. Now, mind you, I hadn't like even had a period. This is way too much information probably for your audience, but whatever. No, um, in like 90 days, I got the vaccine. I don't think, I don't know if they're connected, but I know a lot, it, like for the 90 days after you get your vaccine, your period can do weird things. So I got the Johnson Johnson one and done and i got that one too <laughs> and now i'm like not technically considered vaccinated in new york city which cracks me up are um, you serious well because they're not they're, count in new york they just changed it it has to be two you have to have at least two shots yeah. no fuck off i know i fuck know off. that's what i said i was like fuck this um so i'm glad i just went to new york and got out of there and so I got these prenatals and then I, I remember like unpacking them because I they were overpriced and I just should probably not have got them from, you know, like a fertility doctor. And I looked at them. I'm like, what am I doing? I was I'm 41, not or even 42. I'm like, I'm not a freaking I'm not like a youngster. And I that's when we went back east and then we had that conversation really seriously. And I was like, are you okay if we don't try and do this? And he was like, yeah, I'm totally happy with our life and love you. And we can just be us. And, <laughs> and then I was, I was pregnant and we were having that conversation. So I started taking the prenatals because I was mad that I spent money on them. And my therapist was like, well, they're great for your nail and skin and hair. So like, just yeah. take them. Yeah. And I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but then I got knocked up and we so had, had to, you guys on. had like, had you guys talked about it and like you, like before, I don't, wait, how long have you guys been together though? So we were together um, once before, but we've been back together since September of 2019. So we were together in like 20, I think 17, 18 is when we really met the beginning of 2018. Mm -hmm. And then we dated and it just, the timing wasn't right. And then we got back together in the end of 2019 and okay. um, got married and COVID. Yeah. I mean, we had talked about, we, so I had an ectopic pregnancy, like right when we got back together, um, we got back together and I pretty much got knocked up like immediately, but it was ectopic and that was like a horrible I don't thing think I know what that is. It's when you're it's when um uh like the the embryo gets stuck in either your ovary or the tube and it's super dangerous. They can explode basically if you don't notice them soon enough. They can um cause a lot you'll often lose you used to have to basically lose an ovary or lose your fallopian tube in order to even deal with it it still kills a lot of women because they don't they think it's just like pain in their side and they get it checked too late and then they're internally bleeding um so it's really still quite dangerous and used to kill lots of people before they had any kind of idea of what it was and and how to treat it it's not that common and so that's the good news. Um, so yeah, they noticed it and then they just, 
they treat it with um a shot of chemo actually now like oh yeah yeah to just stop, it stops the cells from dividing and that if they catch it early enough that's usually how they'll treat it and then you don't lose you don't have to like go under the knife or anything so we went through all of that and that was very um just upsetting and sad and also just hard, it's hard on your body and mind and um and then COVID hit. So we were going to go like talk about um, having more kids and go, you know, maybe go to a fertility specialist in early 2020. And then COVID hit and like nothing was happening. So we kind of just lost a year. And then by the time the year was over, after seeing what my friends who had kids go through during the pandemic, which was like a whole other level than what I experienced, it was just they were dealing with so many other things and problems and seeing what their kids were going through. I was like, I'm so glad I don't have kids. I was just so glad I didn't have kids in that moment. And so, yeah, we were kind of by the end of it, we're like, ah, we're cool. Our, yeah. our moment passed. And like, did you want to when you were younger at all? Um, Not really. You know, I never, that's a good question. I, I don't, I think when I was really young, I come from a big family and I really wanted like a big family. And then, but I'll, all I really wanted to do was travel and write. When I even when I was a kid, I just imagined myself as like being a traveler, traveling gypsy and a writer, and and I never wanted like never imagined my wedding. Never had these fantasies mm -hmm. of being like having that. I've been married twice now, and both times I eloped. <laughs> like I just won't do. I won't do it. I'm not doing that thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have no desire to do it and never did. Yeah. I've sort of like, it's funny because I never really wanted to be married, but I did always want to have a wedding. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> like, I like the idea of having like a big party, yeah. but I didn't care that. I mean, I don't like, I would get married now, but I just don't care. Like, it's not a priority for me. When I was younger, I was like politically opposed to marriage. Like, mm. I thought that marriage was a patriarchal institution. Oh, so. wow. <laughs> Wait, and I was you like, want, no, I will all in on that. On the, yeah. on the like, okay, interesting. I never, yeah, got, it like, was... my, my, um, my honors English teacher always used to tell me that I was like, uh, she was like, you are gonna set feminism back like hundreds of years. <laughs> like, she was the person who just was you as an individual. Just me individual. You're gonna be the one who's gonna do it. <laughs> Little does she know I'm on the court. Um, <laughs> she's and we're still in touch now and it's funny she she was the you know you have those like women as you're coming up through high school and college who introduce you to feminism or at least i i did and my mom was a stay-at-home mom and was pretty traditional in a lot of senses and some she was a lot more european minded about just like the way you live your life but for the most part she was very not like um a a you know, like a, a raw, raw feminist or, or whatnot. And this woman was really the first kind of exposure I had to it. And I was like, I don't see what the problem is. <laughs> like, who cares if a guy holds the door open for you? I, mean, I don't really care if he, I, what's the problem with like staying at home and cooking? I love cooking. And she was like, oh boy. Oh boy. I never yeah. really got on board with that. And then I didn't go to college. I never got the, I never got like a real solid dose of indoctrination. <laughs> I feel, I was always like, I don't, I mean, I was just always such a like brat. Like even when I would like, when I remember being like a kid, like being like 11 years old and being like, that's sexist. Wow. And then it just got worse from there. <laughs> and, and then, like, when I, you know, was in my 20s, I think I was just, like, really, really angry all the time. And then I sort of discovered, you know, like, I had, I was, I was reading about, like, kind of third wave feminism a bit. And I was in college. And in college, they teach you third wave feminism. And so they teach you, like, to look for empowerment in the sex industry instead of victimization and they tell you that they teach you that you you know can't have opinions on countries that aren't your own country right mm -hmm. like so um and they you know 
Uh, they barely teach you anything about second wave feminism, certainly not first wave feminism. They don't really teach much about radical feminism. So I sort of discovered that stuff on my own. And it made sense to me in more than third wave feminism did. But then I think, you know, like I got really into like just politicizing everything personal, which I think was probably annoying to everyone around me, but also <laughs> <laughs> probably not that helpful to me because I was just angry all the time because you're trying to fit personal life into a political ideology, like into like an ideological goal as opposed right. to reality. But did, so, wow, that's so interesting. How, where do you land with your feminism now? How like and then did you learn about intersectional feminism just later when you were out in the world or was that something you were exposed to in college too? They taught that in university. So I was in like university for like, I don't know, almost 20 years. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but really like 10 years. <laughs> okay. Because I was very lazy. No, I, I was just, I was always like, I was always working and like, whatever. I was never, I never really did school actually full time. So it took me a really, really long time to get through my BA. And then I eventually did a master's degree in women's studies. And they okay. did teach, they did teach about intersectionality. They were just starting to teach like trans studies. They were sort of switching everything over when I was doing my master's degree in around like 2010, 2011, um, where they were switching all the women's studies departments to like gender studies departments, and yeah, and teaching Judith Butler and teaching about transgenderism and all of that stuff. But um, I mean, like, I think now, like, I just don't, I don't want to identify with anything anymore. So I don't even like, of course, I'm a feminist, you know, like, of course, I'm advocating for women's rights. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't like, I don't like ideology. I don't think it's helpful to attach ourselves to like, ideologies or even to political movements like i don't know what do you think like so did you ever identify as a feminist <laughs> no no okay. i mean i never i know I you never... used to write for playboy so i guess you're not allowed well <laughs> i never kidding. yeah i never <laughs> i don't think i i've ever attached myself to real like i was i was annoying in my 20s like all 20 year olds are and i'm mm -hmm. sure that i would have been described as a libtard by many people around me and parroted mm -hmm. just the stuff that I heard, but really didn't. I just was parroting a lot of it. I wasn't really examining it. I didn't necessarily have any interest in politics. I was surrounded by people when I first got out of rehab when I was about 19, 20 years old. All the people I looked up to and just worshipped were these like radical feminists. And they were so active and they were I, they were all very they were activists, really. And I respected their that they went to like college because it was this this thing that I had always wanted to do and it had just gotten away from me because of drug addiction and life and a lot of things that were out of my control. And then I just started waiting tables and like working and I never I just didn't I didn't I didn't have I didn't care. I didn't care about politics. I didn't care about ideology. I didn't care about any of it. I read books and stuff, but I was far more interested in trying to create stuff and make jokes and write television shows when I was here. And I started a greeting card company when I originally started Fetacy, like in the first iteration of it. And I just wanted to make people laugh. I think when I was in rehab, I realized like our differences are vast but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day when you're an addict or when you're struggling with mental health or there are these things that we all like comedy is something that i feel is a bigger theme um but i wasn't thinking i wasn't thinking about any of the stuff that now i'm like in this culture war talking about and i still know very little when i hear people who like you were um in in university and talking about these ideas and really trying to make the personal more political in many ways. I'm, I'm just impressed with how much everybody knows. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know that that's better because it's like, like what I've come to is more that like, I want, I do just want to deal with people on an individual to an individual basis. Like obviously you have to deal with bigger 
things like rights and legislation and, you know, ensuring that we don't lose our civil liberties and things like free speech and freedom of mobility and all those, all those stupid things. things. (laughs) Yeah. I took them for granted. Oh, totally. I, I never, I never even said like shit about free speech until, you know, maybe, I don't know, a couple years ago. It's hard for me to keep track of where I am in all the years. But, like, for so long, I just, like every other... Canadians are so bad on this. For so long, I just... I didn't really think about it. I just didn't think it was an issue. I didn't think it was anything I had to fight for or defend. And I thought that people who railed on about free speech were like libertarians who I thought that I thought that was a bad thing. I was like, Oh, oh, you're just a libertarian. I thought being a liberal was a bad, like, this is how far left I was that it was like, nobody was progressive enough for me. Everybody was like a liberal, a libertarian, a neoliberal. I didn't even talk about the right. Cause that was like so far away from who I was arguing. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was arguing with other, other leftists and feminists who weren't leftists and feminists enough for me. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, but like that's interesting. Yeah, I just, I yeah, I think I took all that stuff for granted too. And then I don't, yeah, now I sort of like, I don't want to, I just don't want to put people into categories and deal with people as though they're part of some group or category. So I would rather deal with people on an individual to individual basis and not, like, I think that so much of politics and ideology now is just jargon that isn't, you know, or the way that people talk about politics and ideology, I guess I should say, it doesn't, it doesn't end up feeling very applicable to people's real lives. And I don't think it is very applicable to people's real lives. So do, did you go from just kind of being, um, how do you feel about like the patriarchy? And I, I put that in quotes, but <laughs> like whatever, whatever your definition of it is, you, do you land, obviously I, you're not as, probably radical or extreme as you were but where how do you feel about those things now I guess I I mean I don't I don't really like to use those words anymore because again I don't think that people like if you say that I don't think it like what does that mean I have no idea (laughs) (laughs) well yeah no and I think like now when people ask me I'm like I don't know because any answer that I would give would just sound academic Right. right. And I don't think I don't think anybody really knows what it means. Like, I think oh, so much of all this is like games, like it's just people having conversations within a bubble of other people and everybody's pretending that they know what they're talking about, but nobody knows what they're talking about. And they just keep saying the same words back and forth to each other. Like, you know, like to me, it's like uh, there's some obviously patriarchal cultures that we can right. look to wherein women literally aren't allowed to do anything without the permission of a male guardian, for example. Right. Um, but that's not what we're dealing with here. So I think it's like, I just think it's more practical to talk about specific things that are happening. Yeah. You know? When I was talking to Ayan Hersi Ali on, on the podcast, she came on and she said something that just really stuck out to me forever. And it was it's she said basically you can tell how good a society is doing by how free their women are and just Mm -hmm. basically like how the women are doing says a lot about that society in general and that just really stuck with me um because i do think there are i've traveled enough around the world to know the difference between when I'm in a place that's more liberated and free and perhaps Western and when I'm in a place that is um, truly like a patriarchal society and you're covering parts of your body that can't be exposed, like your wrists and <laughs> and, uh, and your hair. The sexy wrists. <laughs> yeah, those, those sexy wrists. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. where, like what kind of places like i don't where where have you traveled I mean, where Egypt, you were like India, yeah, okay. a lot of those places yeah yeah even sri lanka i mean even even places that are still pretty open to westerners for tourism per you know reasons but then when you're out in in the like markets and in the world and the longer you're in those places and i was in sri lanka for months so the more um local you get to know the people and, and the culture, the more you, I, I see that India, I'll never forget just like being at this 
it was um during holy and there was one it was one of the celebrations and there was this massive parade and the men were having so much they were dancing going crazy and like elephants and coming down the street and it was just a, this insanely fun time and you and i wanted to dance along and you wanted to move your body and all the women were just standing on the sidelines very subdued you know kind of observing and i was like this is this is wild. Um, yeah. Party is only for men. We're so free in the, in the it's West. It's like my nightmare. I'm not allowed to party. You're not allowed to have any fun. <laughs> no, really this fun so is for men free. only. We're so free. I just, yeah. Egypt too, you really, I really felt the, um, like the wanting to cover up. You had to cover up before you went in certain, same in India, before you went in certain places. But just in general, um, like the the kind of being like a dirty. There were moments where I was like, I I know I'm, I've I'm getting that look of like you're a dirty Westerner, <laughs> like you know, like you yeah. dirty little slut. Um, <laughs> we know what you're about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, you just I don't know. You just feel it. You feel oppressed. You know, you feel like a, an oppression that I don't have never felt and was really exposed to being from America. And it's I do feel like I we're probably like the freest women ever to live in the history of women of all time anywhere. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I guess that's what sort of started to piss me off about Western feminists, like, you know, especially women in Canada and the US where it's like, you refuse to say anything about cultures where women truly, truly are oppressed and truly don't have freedom and don't have things like access to education and, you know, are beaten and murdered for being raped and are forced into marriage when they're kids stoned. and subject so to yes, stone to death. Like, what the fuck? How is that even a thing still anywhere in the world? Yeah, yeah. And then, and then they're here saying things like, oh, well, things are bad here too. Things are, or even things are just as bad. You know, bad things happen to women. And it's true. It's like, of course, bad things happen to women here every fucking day. Like, women are murdered in in by their husbands every day yeah. you know women are raped every day like lots of girls are prostituted and molested and so on and so forth like yeah really horrible things happen it's not to downplay any of that but people are sawed and to pieces <laughs> people are being sawed <laughs> into pieces <laughs> as we speak as right we speak. there I can't believe it. I thought I was like safe from the construction. I was like, okay, I'm only doing, I'm only it's recording Murphy's at night lot. now. It's Murphy's Law. Yeah, apparently it. it is Murphy's Law. I mean, it's just like, this is, it's just typical of Mexico. Like, it's like everything <laughs> is weird and janky. Like, for I the past it. two days, there's been, it sounds like there's cannons that go off every morning at 5 a.m. And I was is like, the what? generators? And no, it's it's literally it's there. It's a kind of firework or firecracker called like an M80, and oh, okay. it sounds like a cab cannon. It's crazy yeah. loud, and they're actually going off throughout the day and at night because it's uh, coming up to the the day of the Virgin of Guadalupe. So they are okay. celebrating for a week ahead of time, and celebrating means um, cannons all day, yeah, every day, yeah. starting at five a.m. <laughs> Okay. Like my dog is literally sitting, she's sitting right here by my leg because she's having like a permanent anxiety attack. But so there's that. And then of course, there's now apparently there's construction at 8 PM. There's always like rooster, there's a rooster is like 24 hours a day, blah, blah, blah. Yep. But, but I'm free. I'm free. <laughs> Are you in LA? I am. And I'm so I meant to, yeah, no, I meant to ask you how things were there. I didn't want to interrupt you though, just to quickly go back to your okay. point about yeah, okay. like that the difference i think that was one of the things that when i was writing for playboy there was there were just things i started noticing because i was forced into the culture war and the discourse and suddenly had to and i don't think it's mutually exclusive like we things can be bad in our country and we can be want to fight for rights for women here and also fight for the rights of women elsewhere it's more the silence that I think I judge of Western feminists when it comes to like my friend Yasmin Mohammed, who was in 
under Sharia law in Canada in her household and the courts basically ignored the abuse that was going on and it was and was met with silence from Western feminists. And you see this with women like Ayan Hirsi Ali, who ostensibly should be like a feminist icon and is and because of her opinions about something that she experienced um isn't and so that's where that's where my i guess judgment really comes in and my my questioning of the like purity of their their concern for the plight of women everywhere yeah i mean i uh i mean the things that a lot of American liberal feminists say about Ian are really just shocking and really just rude. It's like, do you do you understand what she's been through? No, like, how dare not. you? Like, and then they act like she's being hyperbolic or she's politically motivated. And it's like, none of you have suffered or will ever suffer anything close to what she's suffered and that she's escaped and done all that she's done. And and you have the nerve to to dismiss her in this but way. What happened to you're only allowed to talk about these things if you experience them or whatever that whole mm -hmm. philosophy is. You know, you're only it doesn't allowed... apply to her, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what's crazy to me is that this is someone who has experienced firsthand some of the most oppressive um barbaric things that can be done to women in modern culture and yet is she's dismissed <clears throat> for you know, maybe like questioning Islam or um, yeah, for criticizing <laughs> criticizing Islam. Yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I feel like okay, because like as feminists, we should support Islam. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's, it's so, intersectional. <laughs> yeah, this is what's this is what was kind of that's what's bananas to me. I'm fine. You can criticize. You can say things are. It doesn't preclude you from caring about your own thing, knowing that something's always going to be worse somewhere else. That's true. Um, this was a lesson I learned in rehab, but it does. But you still shouldn't be critical of people who have been through hell. It, it just like doesn't make there's no lot. There's no intellectual consistency there from my perspective. Yeah, that's true. I mean, because it did. It became really popular in. I guess like the early 2000s or so to be like everyone's individual experience is their truth and we all have to respect everybody's <laughs> individual experience and we can't say anything about it and if she says she's being empowered by this then we all have to accept that she's being empowered by this and we can't say anything but apparently that doesn't apply if it doesn't you know fit the the narrative yeah that's really that was really something too that I think I came to and I've talked a lot about this um, just the idea and you said you were taught this I guess in in third wave feminism that the idea that um, like sex is empowering and I found that to be to leave me like really empty over the years and um, I think drinking and drug use were were went hand in hand with a lot of the more promiscuous behavior. But at the end of the day, I didn't find too much empowerment in being um, as promiscuous as I was. And it took me a long time to really come to terms with that because that was, I think, I mean, talking about ideologies, I think that was something that I just latched onto um, out of necessity, out of, justifying my own behavior and out of necessity to make myself feel better about things that I might have been doing that I either felt ashamed about or I would have um, gave me a lot of anxiety, actually, really, when I look back on it. Yeah, I had that same experience. And I also it made me think that a lot of the, you know, young women in feminism who were saying that you know they were being empowered by i don't know things like bdsm and violent sex and pornography and so-called sex work and so on and so forth and i was like i think you're just trying to make yourself feel as though you're empowered by degrading experiences and unfortunately that was a message that that particular ideation of feminism like that was you know, I got that message too. Like I thought that, you know, when I was in my early twenties or when I was 
probably like, you know, 17 to whenever, I thought you, if you acted like a man sexually, that was empowering. Like I was like, I want to be a player like the boys, but it doesn't work that way. Like it doesn't, you don't get that same power from like sleeping around as a woman that men do. And you don't get the same sexual satisfaction. Like that's the irony is that when you're, you know, when I was promiscuous at that age, um, I didn't, I wasn't having orgasms. Like oh, I wasn't. I was. Oh, I wasn't. I didn't. I didn't until I was like I enjoyed it. Or twenty seven. I mean, I had fun, yeah. but I wasn't. I sometimes I had fun. Sometimes I was super bored, and I would just get up partway through and go home, and they'd be like, "Yeah, what's going on?" But I had a lot of unsatisfying sex during that time, and then I had other sex that was like fun, I guess. But I wasn't like getting off, so it was even more or even less of an empowering experience, I suppose, like because the the boys or young men are literally getting what they wanted. You're not, and then you're not, you're not getting the respect, like you're being treated badly. Yeah, I dated a lot of assholes. I mean, so many. And I did, I, I was inviting it. That was like my, my type, I guess. And I, the double standards drove me crazy. You know, part, part of what, what I raged against, I think, in those days of promiscuity was that men could get away with all of this stuff and women were were labeled a slut and you like couldn't get naked and be considered smart. And in many ways, I think we have made progress in that in that people aren't quite as um, as a, I, as attached to the idea that you have to be like the Madonna or the whore. I think there's a little bit more overlap, but I was definitely even like really into the free the nipple movement because I thought that was bullshit that that men could just go topless on the beach and I couldn't. And this is America. (laughs) If I was in Europe, they wouldn't give a shit. I'm always like in Europe. They're like, we've seen some titties in our time. We're 2000 (laughs) years old. Like our culture is way older than yours, America. Yeah. So I did feel like that double standard and the, 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 I guess like contrarian reactionary Catholic schoolgirl in me wanted to just lash out and react to it. Um, but yeah, again, it was like, I learned that if you push the world's buttons, the world will push back. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Great. I mean, yeah, I guess like I, I mean, it is it is a double standard and it's totally unfair and it made me really angry at the time and it still does make me angry. And I don't know, I feel like there's like some people, a lot of people on the right, I suppose, and, you know, in other various like anti-woke groups, <laughs> I don't know how to describe, like <laughs> heterodox people, people who aren't like attached to leftist or feminist ideology or, or who are critical of those like, popular narratives or whatever would say that there's like a reason why it's okay for men to be promiscuous and for women to not be promiscuous. Like women shouldn't be promiscuous because I mean, essentially I think what they're saying is that if you're promiscuous, you're not going to get a man. Like I've, I've interviewed lots of people who essentially, they don't literally say that, but they're essentially saying that, you know, because of evolution, like it's just essentially, it's not, it's not natural or it's not, um, it's not good for, I don't know, reproduction. For yeah, women I, I mean, this is something I talked about. Is. Yeah, this is something I experienced. I mean, something I talked about even just last time I was on Rogan, how I felt like I didn't, des- I was not, you know, I think there, a lot of that rhetoric exists, but then there was a part of me that felt like um, I didn't deserve a good man. I didn't deserve to have kids. I didn't deserve to be um, in a like committed loving relationship or even be loved because of my slutty past, my slutty day, my slutty days. Uh Um, Whether I could admit that or not to myself at the time is questionable. But looking back, even seeing what's coming up, in this pregnancy, like in the early days of the pregnancy, I was like, I think that's why I'm still kind of like, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but in the early weeks I was like, this is, there's no way. And I kept 
having to really interrogate the feelings that I was having. And really at the bottom of it, I was like, what is this feeling? And it was worthlessness and feeling like I did not deserve to have a child because of my past, past decisions. And Mm -hmm. whether that's something that's been told to me by the culture, um, I think it's part partially that, but I also think it's partially what I was telling myself under all of this like bravado for many, many years, you know, the, the, the like hyper promiscuity Mm -hmm. was in such a reaction to, well, one being raped and then some people go one way, some people go the other. I went into hyper kind of promiscuity and, and just that, like, God, I'll I'll be out at a bar now, which is very rare, but there will be, like, some girl talking so loudly about, like, some sexual conquest or something like that, and she'll be wasted, and I'm like, and it's always me that I sit next to this girl, and I'm like, that was me, <laughs> and yeah. I sit here and cringe and listen to this and know that that was me for, yeah. like, a dec- decades. I mean, decades. I was like that, too, when I was in my 20s, for sure. Um I mean, even into my 30s, I was like that. I got sober at 35, so I had a good run. (laughs) I was in rehab at 20 and then went, got back, found sobriety again at 35, and I probably should have died in between there. But yeah, there was a lot of, it was, it was messy. I've been reading my old journals for something I'm writing and holy shit, I don't recommend doing that ever. Which part? Reading your journal. Oh, (laughs) no, I don't plan to like kill me. It's humiliating. It's it's disgusting. (laughs) They're all in Vancouver, so I'm not able to reach them at the moment. I'm going to write this book and then light them all on fire. I mean, I guess like I feel frustrated because I feel like so, you know, when I hear girls talking like that now or being hypersexual and kind of trying to big themselves up over it and I'm not really buying it, partly because like I went through that and because I know better. Um, I mean, I think like it it pisses me off because I know a lot of men who will be like, oh, well, you know, just, she's just enjoying herself. Maybe she really like girls who are hypersexual on the Internet, like girls who are constantly posting like sexy selfies for validation, like who are selling porn on the Internet. I don't know. You probably have a different perspective on all this than I do. Like I'm not a big fan of like OnlyFans account or girls who are trying to become influencers via like constantly posting porny photos on the internet. Um, And when I can tell that, like most of those kinds of people, I tend to just think, those kinds of young women, I should say, I tend to think that they're insecure and seeking attention and validation. And they've been told by the culture that that's how you get validation. And that's how you feel good about yourself. They have every reason to believe that it will work. Look at the Kardashians. Like they... There's every woman now thinks like they can be a Kardashian all, and I don't blame them for thinking that it's yeah. not something that's out of reach for them. And and this is what I mean in some ways, like the Kardashians did kind of break through this weird glass ceiling of a woman <laughs> who is known for her sexuality and did had a sex tape out and then managed to now is becoming a lawyer and a billionaire and... <laughs> Like as much as I'm like, okay, I don't know if that's necessarily the right message. I don't know anything also more American. And um, (laughs) also that she does seem empowered. So there are women that I think can take that and turn it into an empire and and be empowering. When I saw J-Lo and Shakira and they were getting all this shit from like the people, you know, it was was a, a, a very stripper like um halftime show for the super bowl and i felt like janet jackson was owed an apology but at the same time i was like damn those women are in their 50s they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars they look incredible they're fucking sexy as hell and um like good for them i guess you know i mean i guess i don't yeah i don't i don't think it's a good message to send but then i also think that for younger women like if you if you build the entire foundation for your self-confidence on being 
on men wanting to fuck you like that is so temporary and so superficial and i think ends up making you feel less confident of in course. the long run well i mean with j-lo and shakira they're talented you know they have they have, they can build it on other things yeah. they just happen to also be sexy um and have amazing asses and mm -hmm. so there's other things there too but i and i i guess what i was feeling and I've again been through this and showed my boobs online and have had, I was like kind of had a, not only fans pre only fans, but I've definitely been, I definitely like flirted with a lot of these ideas because I wanted to see how they felt and what was true about them and what wasn't. And ultimately I couldn't find my way to empowerment through doing that. However, if I was already feeling empowered, it changed when I got sober. Once once I got sober and I was still kind of messing around, showing my tits online and whatnot, I found a lot of joy out of how angry it made people, men in particular. Um, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Wait, men were getting angry that you were of showing your tits online? they on were. Line? Yeah, because they don't want you to get you know, they think it's like a cheap way to get Twitter followers and it's a cheap. But aren't men's the men, the ones who are looking like, aren't they the yeah, ones who are supporting they are. The boobs? Like but they still hate you for it sometimes. And you know, there's like the whole men's rights activist for like that. Then there's a whole part of the population that believes like your boobs are for the one man that you're with. And like, they're, they're you for know, your baby, actually your baby. Um, <laughs> for my yeah and so i definitely have had like a uh it's been such an interesting ride but once i once i started dealing with my own self-esteem stuff and really getting sober and looking at a lot of these things in therapy and years of work i did find some of that stuff empowering because I was coming from a place of empowerment. And I think that's where mm -hmm. I felt like I was so lied to by the culture is that you're going to like fuck your way to empowerment. If you think that that's not necessarily the case, if you're coming from a place of like trauma, like I was and um, insecurity and feelings of worthlessness, that ball could have rolled in a lot of different directions for me had I not decided to get sober and, seek out like mental health help it could have gone horribly wrong many so, times so where did all that stuff come from the insecurity and and the i mean there's the sexual assault was it primarily i mean so bad? much yeah so much like there there was a lot of of like yeah i, I think it just starts piling up on top of each other and then as you as I was in in yeah, God the just the shit you do in drug addiction and that's the thing like so many when you come into recovery men and women like the shame that you come in with from things you do and things that you yeah just I you end up just in situations that you wouldn't necessarily be in doing things you wouldn't necessarily be doing because you want drugs or you want because you put yourself in a dangerous position and uh and i think all of that shame really started piling up on top of original things and then there were also other things that like i won't necessarily discuss publicly and and there and that added compiled like kept adding to it and um then just my kind of crazy um, once my parents got divorced, my mom got remarried. There was a, a lot of insanity with my stepdad who is, um, had some like mental health issues. So I don't know. I think it was just like a, I don't, I don't know that I started that. I, I, I moved a lot as a kid. I don't know that I started that way, but mm -hmm. I definitely I mean, was like really fucking lost by the time I was like 20 years old. Yeah. I guess I mean, like, I'm always trying to figure out, like, I just think I sometimes feel so hopeless about dating and relationships because I think that you're so shaped by your parents. And like, I mean, like, I hate to even talk about daddy issues because men use that 
so often to denigrate and women and dismiss us as like crazy and broken and so on and so forth. But it really, really does have a huge impact on your relationships and like for the rest of your life. And it's so frustrating because you start, I, or I start to feel like you can't really escape all of that stuff. Yeah. Like I every think- time I think I've like fixed it, like, cause I've done lots of therapy too. And I've like, read lots of books about attachment theory and so on and so <laughs> forth. But like, you know, and I'm pretty like, but you know, and I, I, I really, every time I think I've figured it out and I've like addressed it and then I start dating somebody again and it gets to, and I'm like, oh no, I really, that stuff is still kind of there, you know, like you can get better, but it sort of sticks around. eh? Yeah, I mean, I always laugh because the guys who are like throwing around all that daddy issues shit, shit are always the ones that have like the biggest mommy issues on the planet. So we we have we all have yeah. daddy and mommy issues. You can't yeah. escape it. It's just the way it is. Like being a kid and growing up with any kind of adult role models, um, or not role models, but adult figures in your life, maybe. And so, I I don't think you can escape it but I do think that you don't have to let it define you and I think that you can um work on those things in a relationship like sometimes I think in my experience with this relationship in particular uh, is that you have to kind of heal that stuff in in relationship like it takes being in a relationship Mm -hmm. to heal a healthy loving relationship to heal some of those um wounds and scars and and we all come in with that stuff but I also found that I spent so many years being single and being devoted to being like single forever I was like I'm gonna be single forever and that girl and I didn't want to be in a relationship and I thought intimacy was creepy and like (laughs) I just didn't want any part in it and um yeah I just I realize how much I robbed myself of being able to look at those blind spots because if you want to see your blind spots, like, ooh, boy, get in a relationship. You can do tons of therapy every day for weeks and then get in a relationship. And, of course, you're going to see these things that come up where you're like, oh, this is still here. Yeah. Oh, I'm acting like this again. Like, yeah. oh, I'm triggered by this again. Oh, I'm saying this exact same thing again. Like, oh, I'm having this fight again. Or this is making me feel insecure again. Like, yeah. Yeah. I was listening to the interview that you did on, on Femsplaters yesterday, actually. And that was in 2019. And, like, you, um, I think you'd said that. Well, you said you didn't like dating. That was what you said, which, and and it wasn't, and it was because you were like, I just, you just want to skip to that part where you know that the other per that each other are, you guys are your person. Yeah. Well, it's awful. I mean, it is awful. Like, and I totally agree with you. Like, so, cause I never understand people who like date more than one person at once. Cause I either like, if I meet somebody, I mean, first of all, I don't really even date. Like, I feel like I've never, I don't, I've never really dated. Like I kind of just, like I'll meet somebody through friends of friends and then we end up hooking up and then we keep hooking it up or we keep seeing each other, or whatever. And then all of a sudden I have a boyfriend. Like I've never, I don't like go out on dates and try different people on and like see, like it's either I like somebody and I, I keep hanging out with them or I'm not interested. So I don't keep hanging out with them. But the middle part where you feel like insecure and unsure and you don't know is awful and, and torture. Um, it's so hard to navigate. I don't know how, be- I still don't know. So if I said that in like 2019, that would have been in between breaking up with my husband and getting back together with him. And it, when we met, it was like instant and we were just together all the time. It was monogamous right away we both knew that we wanted to we both had that conversation like I want to give this a fair shot let's not date other people because I don't want to have to I know what my attachment disorders are and issues are so I know I can't do the like oh let's just see how I know that about myself and so I can I, I can have a conversation with someone and and I've had conversations with people before where that wasn't what they wanted and it's like okay cool well goodbye like that just doesn't work for me then because I know myself um then we broke up 
And I didn't, I really wasn't dating. I was just always, I've always hid behind work and being a workaholic and pre-workaholic alcoholic. And so I just didn't have to look at it. And then we got back together for coffee and then went out to dinner and then it was just back on. So I didn't need to, like, I, I just didn't, didn't to need to. Yeah. But that's the way I wanted it to be. I wanted yeah. it to be that when we first met and cause I don't trust that it's like a fucked up position that I put myself in because I don't trust that instant love either. I've put, I've been with, with men where you had that connection and then you're like, Oh, you're a psycho. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you love me instantly because you're a psycho. That's what it is. <laughs> or I'm a psycho. Or together, I should have known psychos. that was a red flag and you known. liked me right away. <laughs> I should have known when you were in love with me immediately that you're a psycho. <laughs> 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 that is true. And so I was not trusting of it. He was in earlier recovery. I didn't, you know, I was like, I don't know. I'm not going to like this. is. I'm just going to be your new addiction. I didn't trust that it was some, the real thing that all the things we felt, I thought it was just like not real and kind of manufactured. And uh, he had a lot of faith in it and really I don't know. I has surprised me has when we got back together, I, he had a tattoo of something that I like, I gave it, given him this coin right before I broke up with him that said true love waits. And he had a tattooed on his arm and in between our breakup and we weren't even talking. Like we just stopped talking and gone our separate ways completely. And I, he was like doing the dishes after we, a couple of dates. I'm like, how the fuck did you know? How did, you, how did you know? But he knew and had faith in it, and I didn't. And I, I thought, you know, to some extent, he wasn't ready, and he needed that time. It was like 15 months in between, mm -hmm. and um, but to a lot, uh, I also realized like I wasn't ready either for it. I cried every week and my like to my therapist I could not handle intimacy at all I had no idea how to hold it at all and I totally freaked out and kind of ran from it and had a good excuse to run from it and it I think it looking back it was the right thing to do for both of us but um so when we got back together I didn't I don't have really any questions about it and that's just lucky <laughs> So how did you meet the first time? And then how, how long were you together? We met in recovery. Okay. So we met in recovery and it was just like on and I kept trying to not see him as much and put some, you know, take my time because I knew that he was, it was a pretty early time in recovery. And I kept saying like, I shouldn't be doing this. I can't do this. This is like within your first year, you need this time. That time I had, I needed it to really get to know myself and get settled in like, being sober after decades of not. And then we were separated for five or we were together for five months and I could never get okay with it. I could just never get good with it. I could never, it never felt right. I felt like I was taking time from him in early sobriety that he deserved to have with himself. And I felt like the only way it would work ever was if we took a break and we both had a lot of like our own attachment issues that were coming up. And then I was like, bye. <laughs> and we broke up and um, I think he knew it was the right thing to do, even though he was heartbroken. And, and we, we just went our, I was very much like never again thought I did not. I remember when I was, when we got back together and started, I sat down with my therapist and I was like, you're never going to guess who's like back in. And she was like, Oh, I hope it's the person I hope because she loved him uh, just because he was so loving. <laughs> I like, couldn't handle it. I was so uncomfortable with it. I, uh. I, I, I was so uncomfortable. So, yeah, I just I don't know. I It doesn't make sense to me even still. It just doesn't. None of it. When I got sober, they they said to me when I got sober, my sponsor said, in five years, you're not going to know, recognize who you are and you're not going to believe like what your life looks like. And I'm sitting here like I, I'll get like emotional. It's just crazy. I never 
Uh, I, I never would have guessed I would be married again. I never would have guessed it would be with a loving, caring man who's an alpha male as well. And yeah. Like, is, is <laughs> like a, not like a, a has to show it off alpha male. And, um, and is, I don't know, just like in so many ways, everything that I could have possibly wanted and then pregnant too. All, all of it is very unsettling you know coming from like my upbringing i'm like when is the bot i have to try and sit with even this and just enjoy it and not be like when's the fucking meteor gonna come because obviously that's around the corner yeah it's too good yeah right? you don't deserve it right i, don't I mean deserve it. you deserve it of course you do but <laughs> but i think but I that's that what so them. many young women now i see you know wrestling with like what you were saying, this culture of, and I, I was kind of online, but it wasn't like it is now when I was like showing my boobs online and stuff. It wasn't, their social media wasn't really that big of a thing. And it wasn't so much in the culture of like OnlyFans. And um, I feel like they're getting so many mixed messages. When, like, when was this and what social media was there? Where were you showing your boobs? <laughs> oh, I mean, on Twitter. Twitter social media okay. was around, but it wasn't, oh, okay, it wasn't it. like, I didn't feel like the, the, um, like the pervasiveness, uh, like the, the kind of like Instagram thoughts. It was yeah. just at the dawn of that. And it was like only fans did not exist and now it seems like it's so so it would be so easy to follow if i was in my 20s and that existed good lord yeah it's just so normalized like i think it just seems to young women like everybody does it right it's like well that's like how things are like it's just normal to send nudes i think now like yeah, if you're yeah. dating somebody i think it's just normal to send nudes or like videos or whatever on all the apps that younger people use that I don't use. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, obviously on Instagram too, but. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's funny. Like the, I went on a pretty uh, like right wing kind of talk show um, and the guy was questioning me about how I would explain to my daughter, you know, like my boobs online because it's a girl that I'm pregnant with, of course. And um what I would tell her and I'm like, well, I think I'll probably use it as a opportunity to have a conversation about all these things because no one ever really had that conversation with me. A, they didn't need to because the internet like wasn't really a thing when I came of age. Mm -hmm. And B, I I just um there's I can't hide run from that. You know, like them I can't run from my past and act like that isn't me if that comes up in conversation ever with mm -hmm. um with her and and then i was joking and i was like and i hope that i'm the kind of parent that she doesn't feel like she needs to throw her, show her boobs online <laughs> yeah exactly. which i realized kind you of undermines everything <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to say, but yeah, I'm hoping that she doesn't want to do that <laughs> or well, maybe she will, but. <laughs> and so do you feel differently about that kind of thing than you used to? Like, do you feel like, do you have criticisms of that kind of, I mean, I call it, I'll, I sometimes call it like porn culture, <clears throat> you know, this, yeah, this, this hyper sexualized, but it's not even sexuality. Like a lot of what bugs me about that kind of sexualization or self objectification or the porny stuff that young women are putting online constantly is that it doesn't really have anything to do with sex because they're just sitting there alone taking 800 selfies of themselves and then putting filters on it and editing the shit out of it so that they look sexy for strangers on the internet most of whom are creeps but certainly aren't people who care about them or respect them or like even like who would want to be their boyfriend or whatever, they don't even know who they are as a person. Like they, it's not, they're not relating to anything real. And this is what, this is how they're seeking validation. And it just seems so not just empty, but you know, again, like I think it's harmful for, for your self esteem because it's, it's not real. And because you aren't creating anything in your life, you're not building anything. You're not, 
you're not doing anything that's going to sustain you in terms of your self-esteem and your ability to feel good about yourself and feel like you have skills and you're independent and you're confident and you can take care of yourself and you're that you're actually good at something like that's something that yeah. really does build confidence it's like becoming good at a skill becoming good at something and feeling proud of yourself or overcoming adversity um or failing at something and keeping going and then overcoming and <sighs> Yeah, and I think I think a lot, um, a lot, if not all, of those young women will get to become our age, and then feel empty and shitty and insecure and useless and desperate to be young and hot again. And I still think that I look young and hot, and you still look young and hot too. <laughs> clearly, thank you. <laughs> but I don't feel young and hot today. But thank you. <laughs> but like. They like I because I know women like this. I know women who put all their eggs into that basket when they're young and now kind of hate themselves. And I really like myself and I know what the difference is. Yeah, I guess to answer your question, do I have different? I, I mean, I had to go through it. I had to go through it. Do I have feelings about what I was telling myself at the time? Sure. Do I, um, Self-objectification was always really interesting to me because I was like, well, if you're objectifying yourself, like, isn't that still a choice? I just people used to accuse me of it all the time, but I felt like they were taking my um, set, like my autonomy away. Like I was like some mindless idiot who had no clue that I was doing that. For the most part, I think growing up where I was like not the pretty sister, where I was like this, the smart one. um, because I was really academic and didn't like wore boxers and a t-shirt and never really thought of myself as pretty. I didn't have any eggs in that basket. And it was amusing to me that anyone <laughs> found me attractive. <laughs> and that, that might seem crazy, but I, it was just like, that was not my role growing up at all. I was, I, and I didn't, care oh god there were just so many i was so not a girly girl even to this day just so not a girly girl and was um really kind of a slow to you know i was still so innocent for pretty late into my teens um until until i just started partying a lot but I think about how old the girls that I went to high school with seemed with their boyfriends and their letter jackets and their freaking like, I just was, I was always like such a awkward dork in so many ways. And then I just started becoming like a partier and I was a stoner and like a thespian and kind of a chameleon and, and moved from play, you know, group to group but never really felt never felt like a part of so the like hypersexualization really didn't start until later in my late teens and my early 20s and then I just thought it was really funny and then I actually really got off on like I I did find it somewhat empowering to weaponize my sexuality. That was fun for me. When I went through my like, I'm just gonna only go after players and just enjoy trying to mess with their heads and be like a, like, um, I really just wanted to be Gwyneth Paltrow and Great Expectations more than anything. <laughs> just like an ice queen and really <laughs> internalize that and embrace that kind of phase of my life. I would say I had a lot of fun. I dated a lot of douchebags, but I definitely got off on like the power I felt. Um, it left me very, very empty. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like I wish I could have done that. I that's like, I think that that's what I wanted to be, but I was fully incapable. Like I would, <laughs> I'm like, I fell in love with somebody. I figured out there's like a formula. Basically, I can't have sex with somebody more than like three times, or I'm Mine's in love seven. with them. 
<laughs> okay, well, you're better off it's than not me. Sex, it's not sex either. It's orgasm. So it could be like oh, three yeah, orgasms okay. and then four That's in fair. the next session. And you're like, I'm fucked. It's like something, some level Once of Once I have an orgasm, I'm probably like screwed. Just one. <laughs> yeah, for me, okay. I, was, I had the seven orgasm rule for years where I was like, oh, no. <laughs> It's like when the oxytocin started kicking in. <laughs> like that's yeah, when the chemicals mess with took your over. Brain for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely. I mean, I de I had. There was there was a lot of there are a lot of men that um, I slept with that I absolutely regret, and then there were a lot that were very entertaining and fun, and I kind of, like, I really, I really inter what I internalized were like movies because i didn't have anything to grasp and i really internalized the wrong kind of movies like great expectations where she was just an ice queen and dangerous beauty where she was a courtesan but there was a quote from it where the mom says love love don't love the man when you love the man you lose and i swear to god that was like my mantra for decades it was just like Love, love. I loved love, but I wouldn't let it attach to any single man. And I really loved chasing the alpha male. Like that was super fucking fun. I that that I was like a predator for many years. <laughs> Not in a bad way, just in a way that I like really enjoyed going to a bar and kind of seeking someone out and just. It wasn't, it's not hard when you're a woman. I mean, that no. was, that's I mean, I've always enjoyed that too. And yeah, like, and yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not hard for women to get laid. But. So I don't want to dig on all of that time where, um, yeah, I mean, to the point that I wanted to, because so many women came to me. I, I, you know what I enjoyed about it is I really got to know men. I really, I was always like the chick that was allowed to come to like the bachelor party and these all boy settings. I was somehow allowed to be in them. And <laughs> I feel like I really got to understand the male psyche in a way that allowed me to A, realize that I was playing myself often and B, um, they're like when a woman's like, why isn't he calling me? Is it because he's playing? I'm like, no, he's not playing a game. When he's thinking, when he's get, when he's thinking about you, he's gonna call you. Like, yeah. men are just he's he's eating, he's working, he's watching sports, he's doing something with his friends. When he's thinking about sex and you, like he's, he's trying to fuck him. with my head, and he's like, no, he's just not no. thinking about he's you not at thinking all. About you. I yeah, know. I feel like we've had like kind of parallel experiences in a lot of ways because I was always the chick with a bunch of bros too. Like I was always. It was always just me and a whole bunch of dudes and we'd be like, you know, I didn't actually, I really hate strip clubs, but it would be me and a bunch of dudes at a strip clubs or me yeah. and a bunch of dudes like partying in some dude's house, like until 9am or whatever it is. Like, so I feel like I was very privy to like, I know what men act like when women aren't around, which actually isn't necessarily all that great. Like I still no. <laughs> like to see how they actually operate when their girlfriends aren't around. It's not great. <laughs> like I oh, was a waitress. I know how men actually are. I was a waitress in Park City, Utah for a season. And I will never fucking trust a man who's like, I'm going on a ski trip. I'm like, oh, really? So you're going to go get a bunch of hookers and like hang out with your buddies? Yeah. And that's the yeah. other thing about being like a cocktail waitress and in, in these in these um in like the service industry for as long as i was in as well you're also privy to like the male parties and all of the all of those yeah i mean it definitely didn't help with my trust issues <laughs> yeah exactly you're like i know what, what you guys do and how you act when women aren't around and i will add hashtag not all men but it, it was eye-opening <laughs> yeah, yeah it was eye-opening I mean, ironically, like, it's like, <laughs> ironically, I still like, I really, I really like men a lot. And I still hang out with lots of dudes. And most of a lot of my best friends are and continue to be men for whatever reason, I get along with those kinds of guys really well. I still am not exactly sure why, to be honest. Um, Do you and I find was, that you had a lot of female friends when you were like a radical feminists and you know what's your experience with females generally 
I mean, I always, I always had a lot of female friends, but I also found women uh, kind of boring, like in terms of like, because I wanted to go out and women, like my female friends kind of never wanted to party as much as I wanted to party. They didn't want to socialize as much as I wanted to socialize. And especially as I got older, I felt like women just kind of like shut it down. Like they wanted to hang out at home and like go to bed at 9 p.m. Even like my single girlfriends, um, never mind the ones who like had kids, of course. I'm like, so- that's me now. <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> it's nine. I need to go to bed. <laughs> I mean, fair enough. Fair enough. But like, I still wanted to, I always wanted to go to do stuff. And like, whether I was single in a relationship, I've just, I like to go out. I like to go to the bar. And so there was a lot of men, but I also felt like, I mean, I'm making sweeping generalizations. So this, of course, is not true of all women. Um, But I found it easier to be myself um, and to be kind of crass and like vulgar and make rude jokes and be sarcastic around men than a lot of women. I found that I find like with a lot of women still even now, still women my own age that we're expected to tiptoe around each other more and Mm -hmm. that women will get, you know, offended more easily than men will and will, you know, expect, I don't know, expect certain behaviors and a lot of those behaviors just aren't innate to me. It's not who I am and it's not how I want to act. Like, I don't want to feel like I'm walking on eggshells. I don't want to feel like my friend's going to get pissed off at me because I say something that I'm not supposed to say or that's not politically Mm. correct or whatever. And I've had those experiences much more with women than with men. Um, Right. So. I mean, is that just the say the culture that we're in where uh, men are a bit more on the defense than they were? Do you think that women were more like united when they, there wasn't, there wasn't so much competition because the market is really in favor of men? No, I think that, well, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say no, because I'm not, um, there's probably things that I'm not seeing. (laughs) But (laughs) I meant like the way that I've interpreted it is that women are socialized to be people pleasers. And so they expect other women to also be people pleasers. And I'm not a people pleaser at all. Mm, Okay. so you're supposed to be always thinking about how like your behavior and whether or not you're behaving in a ladylike way or whether or not you're offending people and you're supposed to be over the top nice and like, no, you're great. No, you're great. No, you're amazing. No, he's such an asshole. You're right. Like, no, you're beautiful. You're so hot and sexy and he should treat treat you like a queen and all this stuff that I just makes me feel tired. I'm like, ugh. And we just like be normal. Yeah. I don't know. Like I was <laughs> – I I don't know. I was talking to this girl who I was sort of friends with a while ago and I'm not friends with any longer because I couldn't, I just don't have the energy for it. And she got mad at me because I wasn't making enough eye contact. I was telling a story to a friend of mine about my miscarriage of all things. It's really not about me. Like, it's really like, I mean, I'm not, I don't get upset about it when I talk about it or anything. This happened when I was 26 seven maybe mm-hmm. um but it was at the time it was like a really traumatic experience just because it was extremely painful and yeah. scary like my doctor had said you know like oh like it'll just be like a heavy period and it was not like a heavy period at all it was like giving birth to a dead baby yeah like, it was like and I thought I was gonna black out and I was like all alone and how far and along no were you one. I wasn't very far along um It's hard to even remember exactly, but, yeah, you know, probably like a month. Yeah. It's still, I mean, even like five, five, six weeks, it's still, yeah, a month in. It's still more than a heavy period. It was just, I I really, I really thought I was going to black out. And I was like, I was all alone. I didn't have anybody around. I was on like a little tiny island in the middle of nowhere, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I was telling this story and she was like, I, I felt left out. And I was like, oh, my God. I can't, can't, I can't think about these things. And like, you're so like oversensitive and I'm just, I'm not an oversensitive person. And I don't, I just, 
I don't know, maybe I'm a trans man. Like, you know, (laughs) like, so it's, I mean, again, like, of course, not all women are like that. And I still have lots of female friends, but I do find it in some ways easier to hang out with men. And I also find that a lot of men kind of like doing the same things that I like to do more than women do just in terms of going out to the bar and watching (laughs) the fights. (laughs) In terms of drinking shot, drugs. Yeah. <laughs> women can't keep up with my drinking and drug use so <laughs> that was always a problem for me and i understand that <laughs> you know, like, leave no woman left behind except for all of them um, sorry ladies <laughs> we're getting another eight ball yeah. um, i'm glad i'd be dead though i'm glad i quit i there's too much like fentanyl and everything and yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely be dead. I, and I, de- I like, I don't know. I, I'm so, it's funny cause it's funny when my husband and I tell each other stories like back from, because we met in recovery and back from those days, I'm like, God, we were like, <laughs> there's a good chance that we would have ended up partying together, but it's also <laughs> really funny that, um, we both made it out alive and we also, you know, he's he's like that person that he describes, and I'm sure he has this experience when I'm talking about that time, is it? I'm much more like, you know, when you're 10 and you're kind of like, I feel like you're so who you are when you're 10, 9, nine 10. It's <laughs> like you're so like the essence of yourself. And then puberty hits and things, life happens, and you, I mean, in my experience was that, I just kept getting lost and lost and lost and lost. And this is the most I feel like that that person who I was when I was 10 and just the sense that I just really like reading and I really like classical music and I don't <laughs> I I'm I'm like a dork and I feel like I get to be fully that dorky um person that I tried to like hide and change and run from for so long and yeah I just I feel very it's very it's a very strange experience sobriety itself is a very strange experience because uh, I don't have the all of that other stuff gets stripped away and so suddenly you're like standing I mean talk about feeling naked and exposed it was so unsettling sobriety so how old were you when you started i don't know what your like primary addiction was if it was drinking or drugs or all of it okay yeah i mean weed is my true love to be honest i just love marijuana more than anything and if i ever do go back to like doing drugs i'm sure it'll be probably like when i'm an old lady and start smoking weed again Mm because i'm growing it in my garden or something Mm -hmm. Like I was a very big hippie and drinking. I loved drinking. I loved it. I mean, I come from a long line of very functioning alcoholics. I think I made alcoholism look amazing. Probably that's not accurate, but it felt that (laughs) way. (laughs) I'm really selling this. (laughs) I was like, I'm really having fun. I really did for a while. Like I had a good run there. Part of Part of why I got out too was like, this is, this is not going to end well. I knew, I knew I was an addict the whole time. And then, yeah, I loved, I, I really just didn't like psychedelics too much because I had too much baggage and I always had, I'm too much. I, I never like, even when I was drinking and using, I never really let myself get like fully out of control unless I blacked out, in which case that happened constantly and sure there there was but that wasn't like I would I wasn't into the idea of like speed balls mi- mixing and matching drugs I really wanted to be the person who and I think it comes from like growing up in a fucking psychotic household where I didn't want to be on like acid and then get a call like I need to come home because xyz happened and mm. now you need to deal with this and you're tripping your balls off and I had so many demons too and I was like by the time young age that I was like no we don't need to open those Pandora's box Mm -hmm. um I love the downers 
and I and I really just didn't. I tried to stay away from like meth. I did meth a, a little bit for a little while, and I freaking hated it. My brain already races. I don't need that. So yeah, mm. downers were more uh, my fa- my drug of choice. But really, it was like a pretty and like I loved Molly and all that. <laughs> like <laughs> I loved them all. I guess <laughs> I can. But really, truly, my love was like weed and coffee in the morning, the hippie speedball. And then when it was an acceptable time, (laughs) starting to add the booze into the day. And then if I went out to like keep the party going, I would I loved blow to like mostly be able to keep drinking. It was really just that's what blow is good for. Yeah, I mean, great. And so I mean, I smoked cigarettes. Like, there, I was fucking addicted to everything, everything. So, and but like, so did you have a job? <laughs> yeah, time? like I that's had what jobs. I, I had lots of jobs. I mean, waiting okay. tables is an amazing job to have when you're okay. a drug addict <laughs> and an alcoholic. You can so easily be an alcoholic and a and a cokehead for decades in the in the restaurant industry yeah right yeah i mean you know what i honestly intentionally i don't know how i was smart enough to know this when i was like 18 years old but i intentionally stayed out of the bar and restaurant industry because i kn- knew how much i loved to party and that if i was in that industry i would do be doing drinking and doing blow five nights a week you know what i mean 100%. like i always kept office jobs i hardly made any money but it was because then i could only go out you know like two maybe three nights a week tops like I would just be like like I knew I had so many people who worked in that industry and I know people who still do and it's just a super unhealthy industry (laughs) yeah Yeah. like and I like to party like I really do but I like to party you know once or twice a week like I I have shit to do like I can't be drinking and and doing drugs every night I got a lot done (laughs) considering um I I really I was like a very motivated stoner. I wasn't the kind of stoner that just sat around. It motivated me. So I was yeah. always trying to like build things creatively. So I always had jobs that were, you know, my, it's funny. My cousin and I were talking about this tonight where she's like, you know, you have to like stop and get pat yourself on the back for the growth and just a pretty short time. And I was like, short time. Like I've been fucking at this. Sh- like I chose this fucked up path when I was like 20 years old and I'm almost I'm 43 years old. So that is a long it feels like a very long time. And even though it hasn't been straight and narrow, I'm like when you're working freelance and like living hand to mouth for that long, it just it like the, maybe a couple of years of like some modicum of financial stability that I still feel could be gone any minute mm-hmm. um doesn't take away those decades of like oh how are we gonna do it this month i don't know we'll see and yeah. f- going and doing like migrant work up on farms and um teaching private yoga and and yoga classes i i worked with autistic kids ironically i was like a life coach for children like young teens wow for a while i mean i wasn't i was i was like um I was pretty functional, you know, there were, there were, I I knew how to like keep it together. After being in rehab, I always kept myself from like going off the rails because I didn't want to have to admit that I was an alcoholic again. What happened was I hit an emotional bottom and that's when I got sober this time. And I wanted to kill myself. And I didn't I didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> and that you were what, 35? Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah. 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 So what happened? I mean, it was a, a a combination of a lot of different factors. I had been traveling around the world for two years and I came back to the United States. I was really partying hard because I didn't know what I wanted to do and I was lost again. And I felt like I was a loser again always just felt like a loser um and then i went back east and i'll keep try and keep the story brief but i hadn't talked to my mom in like seven years and she and i saw each other and that brought up like all of the stuff that i had just buried deep and um i went back to like some very old men and habits and patterns when i was back east in the restaurant industry in within a couple months and 
I was on a plane back here and I just felt like I wanted to, I was like, I'm just going to go cop heroin and kill myself. I just felt I, it was an emotional bottom and it had been coming for a long time, probably 15 years from when I got, when I first originally was the first time I ever got sober. And, um, it was pretty gnarly. Like it was, it would, it, I didn't, I didn't understand I was like, I still have an apartment. I still have a job. I still have a car. I still can function. So what's the freaking problem? But it really was like, I felt like I was rotting from the inside out. And people, when they're like, why'd you get sober? They always want like, I got a DUI. I was arrested. I like there's ran some someone's dog over. Like, like, yeah, yeah there's yeah. some moment of clarity. And I'm like, yeah. I felt like I was getting, I felt like I was rotting from the inside out. And they're like, Ugh. <laughs> like I would have preferred that you had just like killed some <laughs> cat accidentally when you were cat sitting. That's horrible. But it was, yeah. it was like this, it was just all that shit caught up with me. I couldn't run from it. And then, yeah, then I got sober and that was a shit show too. I don't recommend it. I always tell people, I'm like, unless you have to get sober, don't fucking do it. It's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> I can imagine. I'll try to avoid it as, as long as possible. <laughs> Forever, I hope. <laughs> don't do it. Unless you need to, don't do it. <laughs> um, I'll let you go soon. Um, I, If anybody has any quick questions in the live chat, you can use the super chat to do that. Um, I probably should have said that earlier, but also we didn't really have any time for questions anyway. I hope that's okay with you, Bridget, but maybe no one will have any questions and then it will matter. Maybe no one's interested. We're free. <laughs> um, so are you, when do you do? April, the end of April. Uh-huh. And are you nervous or nothing or what? It hasn't, like, yeah, I'm definitely nervous. I'm terrified. Um, it, but it also hasn't hit me. I'm, like, in, I'm halfway, you know, I'll be 20 weeks this Friday, which is halfway. And I have, like, the big, um, like, a 20-week um, ultrasound where they do the whole anatomical scan and they look at every part of the baby and make sure everything's okay. And I'm nervous about that. I mean, every, every single one of the scans has been nerve wracking and, and the whole thing is nerve wracking. And then I realized that this is motherhood. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, I'm never going to be free of this feeling. Cause I'm like, I hope she's okay down there. Like what, what I hope she's all right. And then I'm like, oh, fuck. This is what I was talking to my therapist about it. I'm like, I so wanted to avoid like having my heart walk outside of my body because it's that level of love that you have for that kid seems so beyond something that I, I am capable of comprehending or even handling. And I also think looking, I've been thinking about this a lot, like in light of, school shootings and whatnot. And the, and I get so emotional about those, but I lost a lot of friends young. And I was, I went to so many young people's funerals by the time that I was 21. I was like, I'm not going to any more young people's funerals. I cannot watch mm -hmm. parents bury their kids mm -hmm. and kept, maintain friendships with those parents long after when everyone goes away. And, um, and I think that that had like a really serious effect on my desire to have a child too. just seeing like, I'm like, that is horrific watching that. Like, uh, it's hor It's horrifying. I mean, it must just be the worst thing in the entire world and you never get you over never it. Never get over it ever. No. You're never the same. You never get over it. There's nothing like <laughs> it. When people are like, Oh, I lost my dog or I lost my bear. It's not the same. Nothing's the same. No, there's like not, nothing is like it. And, yeah. and you it, probably just feel guilty for the rest of your life because as a parent, you would somehow blame yourself for or, not protecting yeah. your baby, right? Because it's like, that's what your job is to protect your kid. And then when something or like that Even happens, if it's something like, tragic or like not, yeah. not even guilty, just like that, that it is, you're reminded of it constantly. Every mm -hmm. single milestone that all of the kids, your kids age go through, you're like, yeah. You're, you're robbed. 
yeah of like a whole life with them yeah um, yeah it's it's a so yeah that that is what terrifies me even now i'm like if anything happened i'd be so upset you know i i, I hate like that level of vulnerability with a kid is so it's so i can't like parents have always been like the the heroes to me because i do not understand how, how they do it i don't understand how they like function and let their kids like leave the house <laughs> and just be like all right out into the world you go yeah be careful crossing the street oh it's crazy <laughs> it's so don't let crazy. anyone kidnap you fuck i know so yeah i mean i'm scared about the the scan and and then it's like the birth is i can't even get my mind around it i just i really am like thank god i am in a and like thank God, I've had it drilled in my brain for the past eight years, like one day at a time, because uh, I don't know how else to like cope with so much uncertainty and fear other than like this is and this is like parenthood, I guess. You're just you like pray you die before your kids <laughs> like that. Yeah. I guess that's my next my next hope is like the kid is healthy and that I and then and then I. And that we are both like safe through the birth. And then after that, my next hope is like, hope I die before you and not too soon. Like yeah. even then I, I feel so, yeah, there's, it's so fucking hard. Life is so hard. Life is so messy and hard. And I try, so I, I try to remember that when I'm online and people are coming at me and I'm dealing with a lot of what seems like everyone projecting their in insecurity, vulnerability, insanity, and madness into this one space that I don't know what's going on in their life or what they've been through or what they might be experiencing and what pain they're in. That's really what it feels like to me. The internet is just everyone like vomiting their pain and pain trauma bonding <laughs> as they create more trauma on one another. And I try to, yeah, that's, that's like, that's a good question. I mean, all of this stuff is so. Messy. I try to remember that stuff, like, but I think I fail often, like to be like when people are behaving like irrational giant assholes to me. And like my first instinct is just to be like, you fucking loser. But like, <laughs> I mean, I do, I, I do think, I mean, I still am kind of judgmental of that behavior in that I think that people who behave like that are miserable people. And I know, and I do kind of think they're losers. Like I really, I think that people, I mean, I'm talking about the kind of people who go out of their way to try to destroy other people, like the, yeah. the canceling people, not just like, it's like, I'm sure I've acted like a dick on the internet to plenty of people just in my comments, like just not being nice or something. But people who go after other people on the regular and, you know, seem to clear be getting something out of it. And really, yeah, like they're trying to ruin that person's life or ruin that person's career. And I just think you must be such a miserable, you must like really hate yourself. And so yeah. I should feel empathy for you, but it's hard because you're acting like such a dick and you're trying to ruin other people's lives. <laughs> yeah. It's just, I think it's, I try to remember that it's just outward projected pain. And I, I think that coming back into like a, a kind of little bubble of love helps a lot. And, and remembering that, that this is, you know, my dog, my husband, like this is the important stuff, my family, the immediate people, my friends, I, uh, extending outwards, those, those relationships deserve to be cultivated. I actually loved, I do Sam Harris's meditation, not as often as I should, but today I did it, the daily meditation. And at the end, he talked about all those interactions that you have with your loved ones that not to take them for granted every interaction you have with somebody you don't know how many more interactions you have in your life and yeah. to not take those for granted and to really be caring and attentive and i that like carried i felt that all day long and yeah i'll forget it you know by tomorrow morning <laughs> Yeah, you do really have to keep reminding yourself about those kinds of things every day. Um, I, 
you said you were working were you working on a book is that what you said my god it's on? become like an ongoing joke because i've been trying to get a fucking book i mean michael malice today was like you're gonna make a new life before you finish a book and i'm like i'm literally gonna fucking literally. kill you the next time i see you <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because it is that thing that's so i'm like what is my problem i've been wanting to write this one and then it's just not really i'm like do i want to write this because i really actually freaking hate the culture wars like i really don't like them i've been joking that i'm gonna pivot to mommy blogging because i just i find that so you can write about something that actually interests you <laughs> and i am and the thing is i'll say, say that out of one hand and then i'll see something when we get off and i'll be like all right like the women thing drives me crazy where it's like i feel in some respects that women are being erased women's spaces like yeah. women being in in these prison that is something that i have become passionate about and in some ways like i'm more of a radical feminist now than i've ever been in my life and that's hilarious and i and also like on dumpster fire we're always like women it's like become i'm like i didn't think i'd ever be known now whenever there's something like that online people are like insert bridget screaming women and i'm like i didn't think anyone that would ever be something that would be like my you know people would associate with me but then, so I'll see these things and I'm like, no, this is something I want to fight for. Free speech is something, or the ability to um, not have to like self-censor constantly. These are things that I value and took for granted and, and want to fight for. So I guess on the one hand, I'll say like, I don't like this. And then on the other, I'm like, I'm, I'm choosing to be right in there. You know, it's not like I'm some victim of the culture war. <laughs> I've opened gotcha. my big mouth. Like, I mean, Rogan actually said something and he called me out. So on a, I forget which podcast it was where we were talking. And I was like, if I had hundreds of millions of dollars, there's no way I was beyond mine. Like if I, he was like, yeah, right. If you got $300 million today, you'd be on Twitter like two days from now. <laughs> like throwing shit. And I was like, fair enough. It's he just kind of like saw right, right through it. Cause yeah. I do think that I can't, I can't resist the, there are there is stuff that I want to fight for, and also some of it's kind of amusing to me, which I don't know that that's a great thing. But a lot of it is amusing, and a lot of it I find like super terrible and horrible, like, terrifying, and like and I feel like yeah, like it's what a, waste a waste of life. Like I uh, well, and I also like I feel like this is the end of civilization. Like I should I'm be super learning Spanish. Cynical about this. I should have learned Spanish because I live in Mexico and I don't know how to speak Spanish. And I really, really, <laughs> really wish that I'd learned Spanish at some point in my stupid life. Instead, are I learned you learning how to. It now? No. <laughs> I mean a little bit, but it's not just un poquito. <laughs> un poquito. Uh... Like, I know how to say una cerveza más, por favor. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and un poquito espanol. That's pretty uh, much what I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, so you feel like it's the end of civilization? Well, it's like, so like when I think about what's happening or when I look at what's happening with all this COVID stuff, to be honest, this is a whole other big can of worms. And I did want to talk to you about it also, but I'm also aware that it's been a long time and that you probably have to pee. I do have um, to pee. But like, I, you know, I, I was just in San Francisco and everyone there is dutifully wearing their stupid mask and you have to show your Vax card everywhere you go. And now it's like, oh, now you need a booster shot. And in Canada, you need like a Canada vaccine. Nuts. It's all. I'm never going back. It's awful. I'm so. I have. A, I'm so. So. So glad I have American citizenship because at least, like, if I have to leave Mexico, I can go to the states. Oh, um, you do legally. Yeah, my mom's American, so I have dual citizenship. Oh, so I could just move huge. to Texas if I yeah. wanted to. Like Venus in Texas, or Vegas, or like somewhere fun. There's lots of. I. I. I really like America a lot, but like, I mean. I, yeah, I just, I, I really do, like, 
I always I keep saying like if I were a conspiracy theorist, then I mean, I maybe I am a conspiracy theorist. I don't know because the direction this is going, it seems like a big plot to people to keep people hooked at home and like hooked up to the internet so you can track everything they're doing and make money off of their data, and they don't have any real life interactions or joy, so they go to apps and create profit for corporations. Yeah. And there's more there's more going on than just that. But that really does seem like where we're going. And people just participate. Like even like I get I get so mad even about people using dating apps because I'm like, don't you want to meet people in real life? Like it's so much more romantic and like fun. And like and I, I mean, I hate those apps. I find them so I just don't want to spend my time doing that, but I don't find it fun. It makes me feel kind of ill. Yeah. I'm not, I don't become attracted to people that way. Like I'm never going to become attracted to somebody from seeing their photo on the internet. Like there has to be an interaction and chemistry. Yeah. Pheromones. But like, I don't know. What's, how are things in LA? Um, They're pretty locked down and chaotic and, I don't know. LA's been through a rough patch. I don't, I don't think we're long for it. Honestly, just, I, I can't see us staying here. It just doesn't feel free. I, and I, it's less about like, I just want to be able to like not care what other people are doing because I don't and have other people not care. Like, just let me go live my life. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, I also wouldn't mind having, I mean, the conspiracy theorist in me is definitely like you need land and like start growing your own food and like, totally. where, where can we fortify our position? <laughs> like when we were looking at houses in Texas a couple, a year ago, we were, we were like, how come they don't have on Zillow, like how defensible the house is? <laughs> we're like, we feel like that should be something that is like <laughs> rated. Like, is it on a hill? Does it, Does have, it have a moat? A moat, exactly. <laughs> how defensible is our position here? Oh, That's really that what matters to me. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I worry all the time about, like, I'm like, how am I going to make, like, cash money once PayPal decides that I don't have enough social credits to use it? Do you know what I mean? Or, like... I mean, are the, you into like the crypto world or whatever? No, but I keep trying to. I just don't understand that stuff. I don't but I do Like I'm so bad at that stuff, and it's I like I know that I should. I know so many people here in Mexico who are like making money off crypto, and I'm like, yeah. this seems easy. All they do is wander around all day and then go start drinking at 4 p.m. <laughs> like, why am That's I not? Why they're all in Mexico this? though? Because they know the government's coming for them. Oh yeah, totally, absolutely. They're like, like I, the top. 10 at the top of the pyramid scheme though who like made a shitload of money in crypto in the early days <laughs> i mean you still can make money off crypto but yeah, yeah it's not quite the same as it was at a certain point but like i do i do need to get into that because i don't I trust what's happening right now and i'm not independently wealthy we should alas. do a live stream where someone explains it to us like we're you know 10 <laughs> yes, we should do that. I would really appreciate that. And maybe there's a few other 42, 43 year old ladies out like, there who also if, don't understand. If, if between this late pregnancy and like trying to understand crypto, I 100% feel like a geriatric. I'm like, I'm a geriatric. <laughs> That's just where I am in life, I guess. I'm just an old. I feel, I feel quite young. That's good. And vibrant. Like, I, I, I don't know if I'm like, I feel young and vibrant, but I feel like a geriatric in some ways. It's less about, it's just my lack of understanding certain things like live streams. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's so, I mean, there's so many things in the tech world that I'm like, I have no idea. Like a friend of mine asked me who isn't that much younger than me, but in her thirties, I guess this is fairly recently. Like, so what do you think about like the metaverse and something else? And I didn't even, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, like, and then she told great. me she got a, what is that new virtual like, reality thing called? There? <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Do they have cocaine in the metaverse? I'm there. 
How do you do virtual cocaine? I don't buy it. I, don't I want real cocaine without fentanyl. Wait, though. The, like the VR, like the Oculus Rift or whatever. Oculus, or thank Oculus, you. Oculus, yeah, I bought an Oculus and I like Google Oculus. I'm like, why would you do that? Everyone, stop doing this. What's wrong with you all? Like, and yeah. so many people are just like all in, and it makes me so. I guess I it does make me feel it. old because I'm just like, why don't you go outside? <laughs> I want to learn how to ride a horse so that when there's like no cars or <laughs> totally. electricity, I'm I've got some transportation. My husband's like, "You're losing it." I'm like, "No, we." Need I think that's practical. <laughs> exactly. Like we need practical skills, baby. This I need to. Crazy. I would need to learn how to shoot a gun. Like I literally am like, I need to learn how to hunt. Yeah. And yeah. Or like riding. get a bow and arrow, like Joe. <laughs> Just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get some archery lessons, Joe? <laughs> <No. laughs> How are we going to contribute to the commune if we cannot? I know. I keep thinking of, like, how few skills I'll have when the end of the world comes. I'm like, what am I going to do, know. like, write the pamphlets? <laughs> I always used to joke that I would just be someone's, like, blowjob bunker girl. I'm like, well... I, I, that can be my role, I guess. <laughs> this is great timing to stop because I'm having a coughing attack. Okay. <laughs> this is a great time for me to stop because uh -huh. I just can't breathe or speak. Um, but I think that we should make Joe have us on at the same time in the spring. <laughs> that would be amazing. It would be super fun. I know, yeah. I'm being serious. <laughs> mm. That would be really fun. Well, that would be a wild one. I'm spitting on the screen. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me. This was super fun. It was really great to connect with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I know you're coming on our podcast, so I look forward to that. And um, let's do this again. Did anyone have any questions? They're not a single Somebody one. Somebody asked how you became known. <laughs> oh, that's a good question for my blowjobs. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to tell me about that. No, no, that's not it. But I feel like that's what are the answer. Tips? That's yeah, the, I don't that's need the tips. answer that deserves. <laughs> um, I love when I go on like any other podcast and they're like, "How does this girl like? Who are this girl? I always see her. She just like Twitter, and I'm like." How much shit do I need? To, like, how much do I need to do? I write. I have a freaking podcast. I do a stupid show. Like, I don't know <laughs> what you more. You're you really need selling think. yourself. <laughs> do a stupid show. Stupid. <laughs> Is that not enough for you? It's fucking stupid, but it's <laughs> fun. It keeps me sane. I, I well, I linked all your stuff in the in the show notes. Also, oh, like, cool. I linked to all your your podcasts and Twitter and Instagram and everything. So everybody should just. Head down there and click on all those links. Next time we'll talk about crypto, conspiracy theories, Agenda 2030, and all the yeah. all the third rails we didn't hit. I know there's so much stuff that I left out of my two-page long list of things that I wanted to talk to you about that I knew that we would get through like two of them and then there it would be two be hours more. later. <laughs> yeah, so definitely more. more live streams. Okay, well, have a great uh, sleep. Are you going to bed now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I need to Okay. I'm starving. I'm like, I'm okay. snacking and then go to bed. You can have a glass of warm milk. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good time. Gross. Be careful down there. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye, everyone.